welcome to OAuth and OpenID Connect in plain English. I'm Nate Barbatini. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Cobbler here in San Francisco. I used to work for Okta. I worked on their authentication and authorization and user management APIs, and that's how I came to know and love the OAuth and OpenID Connect protocols. What we're going to do today is just a very short, high-level intro to how these protocols work and kind of why they work the way they do. Um, there's not enough time to go really deep, but my goal is to give you the kind of 10,000 foot view um, and resources and information if you want to dive deeper. At the end of the talk, I'll give a link to the longer version of this talk, which is uh, an hour or hour and a half, and goes a lot deeper into some of the nitty gritty of how the protocols work. Um, but you should come away today f with at least a high level understanding of, of how they work. So let's jump in. Just to get it out of the way, it's, it's worth saying that these are pretty confusing protocols. Even the folks who work on them uh, find them confusing sometimes. So if you ever have the misfortune of Googling how does OAuth work or Googling like something about OpenID Connect, you may find that there's a lot of difficult terminology, a lot of jargon that's pretty confusing at first. Sometimes you'll find just wrong information, wrong advice. Um, so if you feel that way, if you feel confused by these protocols, you're not alone, believe me. Um, it's, it's pretty confusing for everybody, including myself. So what I found to be helpful was going back and understanding why these protocols exist in the first place. Um, that ended up being really helpful to understand why they work the way they do and some of the quirks as well, quirks of why they work in certain ways, um, maybe why they uh, are misused in certain ways as well. So that's where I want to start today. I want to understand the why of why these protocols exist. To do that, we have to go back in time. Um, before OAuth existed, maybe 10 or 15 years ago actually, there's a problem called the delegated authorization problem. That's a very academic way of saying, how do I let my, my website that's over here talk to this other website that's over here and they can share information, share some of my information, um, but I don't want to give my password out everywhere. Now, just to set the record straight as well, when I say sharing information here in the, in the scope of this talk, I'm not talking about advertisers sharing information about you like in a way to sell your data or something. I'm talking about totally legit uh, sharing of your data such as the examples that we'll see here of like, I wanna share some of my photos to my photo printing service so they can print them out at Costco or I wanna share um, my contacts to some service that's gonna go see where my friends are, whatever the case may be. But I'm talking about like legitimate uses of my data. So one of the classic examples of how to do this poorly was back in the day when Yelp was first getting started, um, they had as part of their signup process uh, a step where they asked for your email address and your email password in order to go log into your email for you grab all your contacts and send them all like a personalized invite to, to come check out Yelp. Now, sending an invite to all your friends is something that's like pretty common. Maybe you'd want to do that, but the way they were doing it was pretty bad. Um, I'm not just trying to pick on Yelp here. Facebook also did it. Uh, actually, Facebook did it up until fairly recently. Um, but just to be clear, you should not do this. You shouldn't be asking for someone's real Gmail password in your application so you can sign in as them and then access their email or contacts or whatever. But at the time Yelp was building their application originally, there wasn't a better way to do this. There wasn't a standardized way for some application, some third party like Yelp or whoever it is to go talk to Google and say, hey, I don't, I don't care about seeing Nate's email and his maybe photos or calendar or whatever. I just wanna see his contacts. And I, I don't need to delete them, I just wanna read them. I just want read-only access to his contacts, for example. There wasn't a way to do that, so they kinda of hacked around it by asking for your password. Not a good plan, you should not build it like that. <laughs> and fortunately, they don't do that anymore. The reason they don't do that anymore is because there's a much better way of solving this problem now. To solve this problem of, asking for permission to see like a little bit of my data or a specific piece of my data. The protocol, which is now known as OAuth 2.0, was invented. That was the problem it was invented to solve. And we're talking about authorization here. We're not talking about authentication quite yet. So let's imagine what it would look like to solve that problem today. 
with OAuth 2.0, instead of asking for the user to give, instead of me as the application here, asking for your password, your email password, instead I'll ask you to click on a button that says authorize with Google or connect my Google account maybe. And what happens when the user clicks on that button is that their browser gets redirected over to accounts.google.com. Now they may be asked to log in there, but at least in that case, they're giving their password to Google, not to Yelp or whoever, some you know third party. Um, then they may or may not be asked to log in depending on whether they're already logged in. But the important step is that they'll be asked for this explicit step of giving consent or confirmation that this is actually what the user wants to do. Now you've probably seen this screen before. You've maybe seen it on Facebook or on Google. You've probably seen it a bunch. Do you want to allow you know, X application, Yelp or whoever, to access your blank something, some list of things that they're trying to access? If you've seen that screen before, then you've been in an OAuth flow and you may not even have realized it, but that's what OAuth looks like. So asking for explicit consent or explicit permission is a really important step in this OAuth process. If the user clicks no, then we can just go home. There's nothing else to talk about. But if the user clicks yes, then the browser gets redirected back over to the original application, Yelp in our case, and then some magic stuff happens behind the scenes, which we'll talk about in a second. And Yelp then, or that, that application, gets a special access token or a special string that allows them to go talk to whatever they were trying to talk to originally, get my contacts, for example. And now they actually have permission to do that. Normally, they wouldn't be able to, but because they have this special token, they are able to. Now, if you can understand this, what we're seeing here, this whole four step or so process, you can understand all of OAuth 2.0. This is actually the whole thing. Um, there's a lot of terminology and jargon and kind of uh, nooks and crannies of what we're looking at that you can get into and go pretty deep on. But if you just zoom out to the high level, this is how it works. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the same exact flow, the same thing again, but we'll look at this plus some of the additional jargon and terminology, which is like, confusing at first, but once you see it together, it, it makes a little bit more sense. So let's go back to the beginning. We'll say we're on Yelp.com, for example, and the user, which OAuth calls the resource owner, uh, wants to allow Yelp to read their contacts in a read-only way. The client is the Yelp application or the third-party application. That's uh, OAuth just calls that the client. So the resource owner, the user that's behind the keyboard, you or me, clicks on a button or a link that, that starts the process, starts that flow to go connect to Google or whoever the, whoever the third party is that, that owns that information that the client wants. That initial step, the first step, is a redirect over to what's called the authorization server, which is the, the system that can ask for the user's consent. In this case, because we're connecting to Google, it's Google's authorization server. In that redirect over to the authorization server, there's a bunch of parameters that need to be filled in by the client. Uh, a really important one is where, the, where this whole flow should end up at the end, something called the redirect URI, and that'll be back on the client. There's also uh, a type. We have to set up uh, what's called a response type. In this case, it's response type code, which is a specific type of OAuth flow uh, called the code flow. There are some other flows, but we won't look at those today just because we don't have time. Um, and then the other thing that's really important here is what's called scope. Scope is a space delimited list of just names or strings. Um, and those are specifically uh, identify what the client is asking for permission to do or to have. So in this case, it might be like profile space contacts. Um, but those names uh, are just what made up by the authorization server. They're specific to this Google in this case, the, the Google authorization server. So if you were building a client, if you were coding Yelp, you'd have to go look up uh, the documentation for Google's authorization server and understand what, what scopes are available, like what can I ask for permission to do? Uh, if you look at the documentation for Facebook's authorization server, there's a bunch of other things that Google doesn't have uh, that Facebook allows you to do, like ask for permission to post on the wall or something like that, poke people, I don't know. Um, but the client, explicitly lays out this, the specific scopes that it's asking for. And then the authorization server 
uses that to drive that consent screen that asks the user. It's asking about those scopes. It just kind of shows it in a read, uh, human readable or reader friendly way. If you want to allow application name, client name to access your whatever those scopes are that it's asking for. And different authorization servers will render this differently. Um, the Facebook authorization server will, will uh, explicitly call out whether or not the application is asking for permission to post on your wall or not, because that was a big deal a couple of years ago. Um, but this is all up to the authorization server. It prompts the user for consent. It lets the user know what is being asked for, what permissions are being granted if they click yes. Um, and when they do click yes, the redirect happens back to the client, specifically to the place where the client had said, here's my redirect URI. Here's where I want you to come back to at the end, assuming everything is successful. On that redirect back to the client, the authorization server sends along a authorization grant, basically this thing that represents the fact that the user clicked yes. In this case, the thing, the grant is called a code because we asked for a code, the client asked for the code at the beginning of the flow. Um, and this code is good, but it's not actually super useful. What the code is, is just a one-time proof that the user clicked yes. But ideally, the client application wants more than a one-time use token. It wants to be able to go talk to the contacts API, for example, um, multiple times. So the code isn't really useful except to get a longer-lived what's called access token. What the client has to do is take one more step in order to get the access token it really wants from the code that it got from the authorization server. And this additional step is just uh, an additional security measure because technically that code could have been intercepted. These are just browser redirects. So it could have been intercepted or stolen if there's like some malicious script running on the page or you have a weird toolbar installed in your, your Chrome extensions or something. Um, the code could be stolen. So we want to make the client do one more step to, to let the authorization server verify that code. So there's an exchange step where the client says, okay, I got this code. What I really want is an access token. So I'll send that back up to the authorization server and say, hey, I have this code, can you give me an access token for it? The authorization server says, let me check, make sure that it hasn't been already used or it hasn't expired or any, everything else. Then assuming that all checks out, says, great, here's your access token. And the client can then go talk to whatever API it was intending to talk to in the first place and say, hey, contacts, Google contacts API. Uh, normally, <laughs> if, you, if I asked for Nate's contacts, you would tell me to get lost. But because I have this access token, it's okay. And the Google Contacts API will see that access token coming in, say, well, let me check first, check to make sure the access token is valid, hasn't expired, isn't, isn't you know, forged or tampered with in any way. And assuming that all checks out says, you're right. You do have permission to see Nate's contacts because he said you do, here you go. So this is the whole flow with some more of that jargon in there. There's more to dig into, I'll, like I said, I'll give some links to the longer version of this talk at the end. But if we move on and to kind of take a look at what happened in the industry after the introduction of this protocol, OAuth 2.0 became pretty widely used and adopted for solving this authorization problem. Uh, Google adopted it, Facebook adopted it, and that drove a, a bunch of people. It, it became a pretty widely adopted standard, which is awesome because standards are super useful if everybody's using them. Um, then, Ultimately, it ended up kind of becoming a victim of its own success in a way, because what happened after that is people started using OAuth 2.0 for authentication as well. And it wasn't designed for that originally. What it was designed for was authorization, not authentication. Now, that could kind of sound like a, a academic difference, I guess, but there are specific things that OAuth does not have in it that are useful for authentication. But what happened was, um, if you remember when social login kind of burst onto the scene, Facebook uh, added the sign in with Facebook button and then Google did and Microsoft did and a bunch of people did. Um, if you look under the hood, all of those sign in with X buttons were all implemented with OAuth 2.0. It was kind of good because it was a really widely adopted standard. So it was fairly you know, easy for people to do that, I guess. But it also was not great because since OAuth 2.0 was not originally built for authentication, it's missing stuff like uh, it doesn't have a standard way of getting the information about who just logged in. 
the, a standard way of getting like the user's profile info. And because it didn't have that, when Facebook built the sign in with Facebook button with OAuth, they added their own kind of hack on top of it to make that part work. And then Google added a different, slightly different version of that hack to their, to their button. Microsoft did it a little bit differently and so on. So now you have a standard that's being used and kind of extended in these proprietary uh, implementation specific ways. And it's not as good as a, uh, not as good of, as a standard anymore because it's being used in non-standard ways by everyone. Um, so that's a little bit frustrating. It certainly made the landscape a lot more confusing um, and also helps explain why uh, some of the information you read about OAuth is so confusing as well. Because when you look closely at what blog posts you read or information you read about OAuth, half the time it's talking about the original use case of authorization, you know, asking for permission. And the other half of the time is talking about authentication, uh, logging a user in, signing a user in, or sign, single sign-on across websites or something, um, which again is not what it was originally designed for. So to help kind of untie that knot or solve that confusion, some folks went and said, look, OAuth 2.0 is obviously very successful. It's very popular. It works really well for what it was designed for, but it's got some gaps. It, it doesn't quite solve this authentication piece, but it's clear people want something that does solve that authentication piece because they're like hacking up OAuth to do it. So in order to kind of standardize all those hacks that people were doing on top of OAuth, that is where the, the impetus and the effort and the ultimate result of building a protocol called OpenID Connect came from. So OpenID Connect is nothing more than a fairly thin layer or set of extensions on top of OAuth. It doesn't deprecate OAuth, it doesn't really replace anything, it just adds some additional uh, endpoints and additional behaviors on top of OAuth 2.0 using the existing mechanisms that are already in place. So if you understand how a OAuth flow works, you already already know basically everything about an OpenID Connect flow, except for the like 10 or 20% additional that you have to understand about the specific way that OpenID Connect works for authentication. So that kind of brings us to the current practice where OAuth 2.0 is still widely in use for the thing it was designed for, asking for permission, you know, asking for authorization between different uh, systems. And now OpenID Connect is being pretty widely adopted for the authentication piece for if you want to actually sign the user in or you want to do like single sign on across multiple websites, um, that's where OpenID Connect really shines. And you're seeing that um, Google rewrote their sign in with Google um, functionality using OpenID Connect now, as it should be, instead of the old way they were doing it with OAuth 2.0, which is a really good thing to see. So that brings us to the end of our pretty whirlwind <laughs> tour of OAuth and OpenID Connect. Like I said, there's a longer version of this talk uh, that I recorded last year. I created a short URL you can go to oauthacademy.com slash talk if you want to see that. Um, you can also hit me up on Twitter. I'm at, at nbarbatini. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about OAuth and OpenID Connect. If I don't know the answer, I'll, uh, I'll try to find some information for you or at least point you in the right direction.